And we're back with a quick tutorial on using steam turbines powered by volcanoes or volcanic steam turbines. Now, a quick forward, I still believe a volcano is best used to run a petroleum boiler just for the advantages it gives you. But if you do want to, if you do have excess ones or if you just want to use them for power because you have some other power source in mind, they can be hooked up quite handily. However, you do need to be aware of quite a few mechanics. There's quite a few things going on here to make something this simplistic. So we'll just go over all the main ones as quickly and efficiently as we can. First thing you need to be aware of is magma can form tiles or debris. And the only difference between it is how much there is in one tile. It's pretty much this, there's differences depending on the liquids, but for magma, it's 1,473 kilos will form a tile. If you have one kilo less than that at 1,472, it will form debris instead. And that's it. That's the only difference between the two. It's usually easier to work with the debris because it, it's just simpler, but at the same time, it's harder to get the heat out of the debris. The tiles are allow you to get the heat out a lot faster, as you'll see there. That's plummeting rapidly in temperature while it's in contact with that, way faster than the debris. However, you do usually have to get in an automatic mining drill to take care of the problem. Next up, we've got this little trick. I picked this up from Tony Advanced Oni. I'll put a link to his uh, tutorials down in the, in the description. Now, this here is just a mesh tile. And what happens is if magma tries to form a debris inside a mesh tile, it will get kicked out to the side. Now, in this instance, what I've done is this one's 1,473. 1, this is 1,472. We'll drop them in there. And then uh, we'll just add in a little hydrogen to see what happens. And if we burst those in, you see that the igneous rock popped up to the top. And in this one, where did it go? Right? Well, if we deconstruct this tile, it kind of vanishes. But effectively, it sort of encases the mesh tile, which is kind of an annoyance. There's nothing really much you can do about it. You'll see there, there's the igneous rock is there. It's displaced the gas, but you can't really do anything with it until you dig it out. Oh, can you even dig it out? I don't know. Just don't let it happen. It's kind of buggy when you, if you let uh, magma solidify inside a mesh tile. Now, if we do one minor modification to this experiment, in this experiment, we've got the same thing again, 1472, as in a debris forming tile and a tile forming tile. We'll just drop them down there. Then we'll just uh, brush in a little bit of hydrogen here to cause them to change shape. This one bugs out and this one gets forced out the side. The debris here couldn't pop up the top. Since there was gaps around it, it slid out the side diagonally. This is very handy for, well, cooling down the magma in one area and then forcing the debris into another side. Makes it very handy. We'll cover more on this later. Well, that's just a very important mechanic to have a grasp of. Now, next up, this is a magma dripper. Well, it's the basis of the mechanics of a magma dripper. If you break out the bottom of a, a magma tank, magma has a, it's a very viscous liquid and it will only spread out so far. If we just let this flow, it will form exactly 10 tiles right there and it will go no further. And one great thing about this is it's called, a, I just call them a magma blade, but it gets smaller and smaller as it goes out and there's less and less and less magma to work with. This allows you to, well, peel off bits of magma without having to worry about dumping in a whole tank all at the same time. Uh, up here, you'll see this mechanic in use here, uh, or sorry, and over here. It allows you to just drip in small controlled amounts. It's a very handy mechanic. Now let's just cover one annoying mechanic. This one was covered very well by uh, Tony Advanced only in his tutorials, but I'll just cover it briefly here. This is a piece of igneous rock tile, or a piece of igneous rock debris, and it's chilled to minus 266. What we're going to do here is drop some magma in here, and when that magma solidifies, we're just going to drop in a little bit of magma. When it solidifies, it will take on the same temperature as the igneous rock already in there. Uh, just to use an example, we'll turn that on, we'll close that up. Now, we've just dumped in a whole bunch of magma. In fact, we've dumped in about 550 kilos and you'll notice the rock is still minus 234. And it's not because of the supercoolant. It's because the moment the magma hit that plate, it just immediately turned right into igneous rock of the same temperature. It's just a, an averaging technique that was used by the, the programmers and it just results in an annoyance. If you're dumping magma into something and there's already an igneous rock tile there, you're losing all the heat between those two. It's also a handy way to cool stuff down. There's, there's a whole bunch of fun mechanics you can do with this. But by and large, when you're working with magma, this can cause you horrible problems and you can lose a whole bunch of heat that would have been useful in your steam boiler. Okay, so that covers most of the major mechanics. But now let's cover something to do with heat transfer. I mentioned earlier that when you're working with igneous rock debris, as in the debris chunks, it's really hard to get the heat out of it. So I want to show you a few things here, or a few different differences. Uh, right here, we've got igneous rock. We've got 48 tons of it in all of these. The moment I dig these out, though, they will change to 
24 tons, which is about the maximum size tile of igneous debris tile or de debris that it will ever accumulate to. Now, they're all above steel doors here. All these steel doors are in contact with diamond window tiles. Those window tiles are in, sh in touch with one ki one ton of water. All the water is the same temperature. All the everything here is the same temperature, effectively. The only difference is how we're going to extract the heat. I've put in an extra temperature shift plate over here so we can dump in some extra, stre extra steam. So we'll just uh, sample some steam out of here, let's say, and we'll just brush that in to help with the... Ooh, you know what? Yeah, we'll leave it in as hot steam. That means that igneous rock debris is going to be transferring its heat a little bit better because there's the steam to work with. This one here, we're just going to let that drop on top of the door. The debris will transfer heat into the door. The door will transfer it into the diamond window tiles and into the water. This one over here, though, we're going to open the door, let the debris fall in, and then we're going to lock the door behind it. And now the debris is trapped inside the door. And if we check the temperature overlays, you'll see this one, of course, has rapidly gone up because, well, we did dump an awful lot of steam in there. However, this one over here, you'll notice the temperature is rising rapidly. This here is the steam room, this here is the nothing room, and this here is the debris trapped inside the door room. The reason is, when debris is trapped inside of a door, it really transfers heat an awful, awful lot faster. It's the fastest way to extract heat from debris. Debris on top of something, well, it's not very good. It, it exchanges temperature pretty slowly. And in this one over here, I'm not even sure, is that better or worse? Oh no, it is, it's definitely better. The uh, the liquid, or even the gas, if it's there, will help transfer heat between the igneous rock pile and the door itself. Though, do put in a temperature shift plate to help it along. So as you can see there, they're slowly all dumping heat in, and I think this one is the one that's going to boil first, that one will be second, and this one will be a very, very distant third. It's just a, the three different ways you're going to be getting heat out of igneous rock. Another thing you can do is you could use uh, other liquids like lead or things like that, because this steam, steam is probably not quite as good as liquid lead for extracting heat from debris. With all of those mechanics out of the way, I know there was a lot of them there and there's a lot to take in, but you know, you can always hit repeat on the video and go back and go slow if I know I talk a bit quickly, but I'm trying to keep these nuggets pretty condensed. All of those mechanics are at play in this one design. Uh, what we have here is we have your little mesh tiles here so that the magma can fall down. When it gets down here, there's a temperature shift plate behind there. Now, temperature shift plates can extract heat diagonally. So this temperature shift plate here is in contact with all nine tiles around it. Same with the diamond temperature shift plate down here. It's pulling heat out of that magma that's just dripped down there. That heat, when it pulls the heat out, the magma solidifies, turns into debris, and the debris gets kicked out sideways and thrown into the steam room. And then that just sits there on top of these diamond window tiles with the temperature shift plates behind it, surrounded by steam, dumping heat into this room. And that allows us to run the steam turbines. Now, steam turbines do give out a lot of heat. If you'll check there, the heat production is 91 kilodTUs. This one's about, well, about the same. To put that in perspective, a plastic press. A plastic press has 32.5 kilodTUs of heat that it gives off. So you've got three times the heat production of a plastic press. That's six plastic presses in one spot. Now, maybe you haven't got as far as plastic presses yet, but just let me tell you, it's a lot of heat. So anytime you're going to be doing anything with steam turbines, it's a good rule of thumb. You're going to be using a thermo aqua tuner. Reason being, it generates a. You can use that to generate cooling. The cooling goes up here and goes around, cools down the design. I, I will include the save file that contains all of this stuff, so that you can all go through and play with it yourself. And that's all we're doing is we're using this aqua tuner here to throw in cooling to keep the steam turbines active. And the any heat the aqua tuner gives off is also fed into the steam turbine. So it's a nice little uh, self-contained system for cooling and providing power all at the same time. Now, you'll notice there's some automation behind here. This automation here is to do with not wanting too much magma to be dumped in here. Like what's going to happen here is you'll see the magma is in there and this temperature sensor is set to cut off the flow once it hits 185 C. However, these things have a bit of a delay. It takes them a tick or two of game time to update. Plus you're going to be pouring in an awful lot of magma. So if we check it here, you'll see the temperature spiked to 215 degrees, 248, then it, it plummeted down again. Uh, Thankfully, this doesn't really, it, it does max this out a bit if you put the temperature a little bit too high. So we're trying to control ex precisely how much magma flows in. So that's why we have the magma blade. Magma blade just means we're only getting 56 kilos of magma at a time when we open the door. And with just a little bit of smart automation, we can ensure that we only open the door for a small period of time, half a second. Effectively, this goes up here, tells the door to open, and then half a second later, this automation tells it to close. For a simpler explanation, let's go down and have a look at it all stretched out. What I have here is just a hydro sensor hooked up. This hydro sensor is going to simulate the, the temperature sensor telling the system, hey, we need more heat. So you flip the switch and you say, we need more heat in here. The moment you do, the door opens. However, that signal comes right across here and hits this buffer gate. That resets the buffer gate and says, hey, 
stay on for 10 seconds no matter what. That jumps across this system and hits this filter gate. And the filter gate here I've set for three seconds for demonstration purposes. In the real system, the filter gate is set to for 0.5 of a second, so the door only stays up for half a second. But here we just want to slow things down so you can get a good idea of what's happening. So this is turned on. It sent, the signal, it sent a green signal in here, which tells this one to send out a green signal. This says, OK. It locks the door open. The door is open. And then three seconds later, this will have finished its cycle, and it sends out a green signal. That sends this a reset signal, and that reset signal causes a red signal to get sent out. Let's just watch that again. This will count down. You know what? I'm going to reset this away from 10 seconds because it's too long. We're going to set this for five. Five is good enough. And once that resets again, the door opens. It stays open for three seconds. Once it's finished, door closes. Boom. It just means we pour in tiny amounts of magma just for a split second at a time. So let's reset this to the actual values used in the system. Here is everything reset to actual values in the system. We'll turn it on. We say we need magma. Door opens for a split second, then closes. Door opens for a split second, then closes. That's all that happens. So this allows just a tiny piece of magma to pour in, and it allows us to very precisely control exactly how much magma is coming in. Also having it at the end of the magma blade, make sure we just get 56 kilos at a time, just a little dribble that gets kicked out sideways into the system. Now, as you can see, we're not really doing very much to extract the maximum heat out of the magma were, well, of the debris. The debris is sitting there, it's surrounded by steam, and that does help with the temperature transfer, but there are things you can do to improve upon that. Here is a slightly more complicated version. This one, though, still has the exact same thermal aqua tuner going through it, though I've removed the buffer tank in this one. It's not really necessary to have the buffer tank, but I did like it in the older version. But in this one, same sort of system for cooling. However, over here, it'll look slightly different. We've got a sort of a buffer system going on and some random doors and pieces. This here is the temperature control. This is what allows us to decide when the temperature is, what temperature we want in here. So we want 150 C. All that happens here is this opens the doors. Now you'll notice here that debris drops down there. There's a one minor change between this and the previous version. I've set the filter time to one second. If you keep it at less than one second, the door won't open enough for the debris to drop down in it. We want to trap that debris inside the door. And you notice there's 176 kilos. It didn't quite trap at that time, but it has a tendency to trap it. Though, not always. You notice here there's some igneous rock in different piles. But by and large, it will eventually trap it in there, and at that point it starts to rapidly transfer heat between the mediums. Very handy way of dumping heat in. Now we've set that to 150, but the temperature is realistically controlled on this set as well, so we can dump in as much heat as we want as quickly as we want. So let's make this about 500 C, so we can get a decent amount of temperature in, and we can get this system up and running sooner rather than later. So the system is starting to, well, boot itself up. We are consuming an enormous amount of magma, but all we're doing is we've got a temporary sort of storage system here that stores about one ton of water at 500 C while it's getting there. And then when we want heat inside our steam turbine area, this door engages, drains heat out of this area, and dumps it into our steam turbines. This just gives us a, another way to control the heat. Unfortunately, it, it does introduce an awful lot of complications. If we'll check the automation here, Pretty much the same automation as before, but now we've got three doors going on and we are using the debris trapped inside a door technique to extract the heat more efficiently. This does allow you to extract the heat more from a volcano and usually get one up and running faster. The difference in efficiency between this design and say this design, this design you're not going to be able to extract the heat quickly at the start and you'll have to wait until these igneous rock tiles pile up. Uh, if you'll notice igneous rock piles up to about 24 to 25 tonnes, at that point, it splits and becomes two piles. So as more and more piles accumulate inside the system, it becomes more and more stable. The older piles will have dumped more heat. The newer piles will have lots of heat in them. Uh, I'll do more on that at the end. I have a, a Let's Play I'm doing that has one of these that's been running for quite a long time, and I can show you how they stabilize out in the end. This system, however, we've set it to 150. You know what? Let's set that to 180. Get this sucker up and running at proper speed. This system does allow you to extract the heat more efficiently from the debris and more quickly get your system up and running to a good syst ah, to a good temperature. At the same time, it usually allows you to run more steam turbines faster. So if you're looking to get the absolute maximum out of your volcano quickly, this is a nice quick way to do so. This here is one I built in a survival. It's ran perfectly for me for hundreds of cycles. It works just fine. Now, however, there are advantages and disadvantages to the two different brands uh, on offer. The advantage of this one is sheer simplicity. It can't really break, and I've stress tested it across several hundred survival cycles. Downsides, you can't shut it off. Well, not quite true. 
if I say turn this off and said, okay, no more heat injection, let's just say, yeah, you're not going to add any more magma unless it's blah, and I stopped it from injecting fresh magma. Well, unfortunately, there's all this igneous rock piles that are right here with lots and lots of heat in them, and they will keep dumping heat into the system. So there's no real way to turn this off. It's not a system you can turn on and off. This is generally a system you will turn on, dump power onto your grid, and it will just constantly keep dumping power onto your grid, whether you use it or not, which is a downside sometimes. If you don't have battery banks to take advantage of that, uh, you could be in trouble. Secondly, I usually only hook up steam to steam turbines because, well, this one was very far away from my power spine. If you look at the power overlay here, I just use one two kilowatt wire because this can't generate any more than that. And I dump it back onto my main power spine using a transformer. This allowed me to run it back on and dump useful energy back onto my grid. However, if I was to say run three steam turbines, which you can do quite handily with the other design, I wouldn't be able to do that. I'd have to run a heavy watt wire or I'd have to run two of these wires going back with the transformer. Uh, that's pretty much the advantages and disadvantages of that design. The disadvantages of this design are, I haven't stress tested this. This one I just threw together using the knowledge of the mechanics I had, and it should work theoretically fine, but with any designs, there's usually some kinks you do have to work out. The advantages of this one, though, are it's a system you can turn on and off whenever you want. For example, if we were to hook this up to an automation wire right here, we can send this a signal to say, turn off, we don't want you anymore. What will happen is this will stop injecting heat into the system once this in once the temperature in here has hit what you want. 180 was what we set it to, so now the whole system stops. No more heat is injected, no more magma is poured in here, everything turns off. Effectively, you can hook this up to your batteries in your power grid and turn it on and off as you would, and you don't have to care about wasting anything. Any magma that's spit out by the volcano should go into your magma tank, assuming you built a bigger one. This one was just uh, quite small. Should get stored up in your magma tank, and you can turn the power on and off as you wish. The downsides are, though, you'll also have to probably run a heavy watt wire. This is quite a chunky beast. Now, this is just a sample map, so I didn't bother running the heavy watt wire, but you'd probably need to run some heavy wire or some sort of heavy thing to carry out the power. Otherwise, the system is quite stable. Now, in the tutorial, I'm not going to th go through exactly how to build one of these. I built one on a let in, in a Let's Play, so it, it, these are pretty straightforward. The only real weird kink when you're working with them is, normally what happens is when you build your magma tank, you're going to leave a brick there. And then when the time comes, you usually build a ladder up, deconstruct that brick from the other side while this metal door is in place. It's all, it's all covered in the Let's Play. I'll put a link down below and I'll try and timestamp it to about the relevant time period. But uh, the biggest advantage of, say, this design is if you have multiple volcanoes in one area, two or three, you can feed them all into one, feed them all into one tank, feed it all into one system of this, stretch out five or six steam turbines and run quite a chunky power production facility. Also, make sure you can you can do multiple different designs of the magma tank. It doesn't have to be designed quite like this. You can make it deeper, wider, whatever you want. Save game file of this before I turned on this boiler will be uh, linked down in the description. I will also include a link to Tony Advanced Tony's Let's Plays where he uh, does some more more deep dives on mechanics of magma. And I will also include a link to the timestamp location on the Let's Play where I build one of these. Anyway, hope this was at least mildly informative or not too information dense and uh, good luck.